In so many ways, Henry Ford was a simple man. He liked to go camping with his friends. That's Thomas Edison behind him. He enjoyed old-time country dancing. Here he is with Burroughs, the naturalist. Skating with his grandchildren. They plant a garden together, Henry Ford II and Benson. His first car, he called it a quadricycle. That's his wife, Clara. He began with an idea that most people thought wouldn't work, but he made it work. And the tools he used were common sense, ingenuity, and perseverance along with a natural instinct for knowing how to put machines together and make them run. He was born into a world of limited horizons, and though he left the farm that might have been his heritage, he never lost his love for the land and the everlasting cycle of seed time and harvest. What he accomplished helped men put the burden of work on machines and broke the barriers of space and time, of isolation and distance. His life was a paradox. While his mechanical genius helped to change forever the lives of people everywhere, he sought to preserve in some permanent form a record of the world around him and his ever-widening interest in it. He collected buildings the way others collect stamps and put them in a village where time stands still. He assembled acres of machines and put them under cover in a vast historical museum. And early, he discovered the astonishing capacity of the motion picture camera to document for all time whatever it saw when the crank was turned. In April 1914, at his Highland Park plant, he organized a motion picture department which through the years produced films that were shown in theaters and schools throughout the country, travelogues, newsreels, and documentaries that touched on nearly every facet of American life. This is the way the country looks in the years before the First World War. Rich, rolling, but often inaccessible. The man on the farm works as his forefathers have. It's a hard life for man and beast. Because there's no place to go and no light to read by. A man thinks twice before he goes to market on roads like this. And sometimes he never even gets there. It's a long walk to school on a muddy road. More fun to go by sleigh in the winter. 
During recess, there's time for a snowball fight. Of a climb up the old elm tree, if you've got the spunk for daring deeds like this. The one sure way to get someplace is on a train. Life in the city moves at a slow pace. This is Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington. No trip to the Capitol is complete without a tour of the White House. President Wilson lives here now. The East Room with its chandeliers and shiny floors. There's more hustle and bustle down at the market, Faneuil Hall in Boston, or in New York City on the Lower East Side. Always plenty to do and see in the big town. Ride the elevated train all the way from the Battery far uptown. There's the Hippodrome, one of the big theaters in New York. Another way to see the city is a boat ride around Manhattan Island. All aboard. Watch out. Some city slicker may try to sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> There's a Navy cruiser at anchor. Great ocean liners along the Hudson River. Mighty tall buildings in New York City. The Flatiron Building, shaped like a triangle. And the Woolworth Building, 60 stories high, tallest in the world. You look at that traffic on Fifth Avenue. Kind of peaceful over on Riverside Drive. Grant's tomb, always one of the favorite sights to see. Sunday in Central Park. There's no place like it for a leisurely stroll or a boat ride on the lagoon. even get wet if the water's warm enough. And where do we go on vacation once a year? Atlantic City, of course. No, that's not a real elephant. It's a hotel at the end of the boardwalk. Look, they're waving out the elephant's eye. The Atlantic Ocean, and a few hardy acrobats. Most of the time, we'll stroll along the boardwalk or ride along in the rolling chairs.
every city has a pretty park. This is Belle Isle near Detroit, with lagoons for a quiet afternoon ride in a canoe, if you don't mind the crowd. Some like to dance, while others gather around the piano to listen. In the winter, the adventurous go ice skating. It's easy if you know how. For the really daring, there's nothing like the thrill of an ice boat on a clear, cold day. Or the fast track on a toboggan slide. And there's plenty of speed at an auto race, once they get going. Buffalo Bill himself, William F. Cody in his 71st year and straight as an arrow. It's 1916 and he's out on tour with his circus again. Indian war dances, bucking bronco. of baseball season and time to throw out the first ball. Snapshots of other people we know. John Burroughs, the naturalist, waves to admirers. Luther Burbank, an expert in horticulture. In his experiments, he's removed the spines from the cactus. Says it's good to eat, too. We'll take his word for it. Thomas Edison in San Francisco in 1915. He's out for a drive with his wife and Mr. and Mrs. Harvey Firestone. Joseph G. Cannon of Illinois, former Speaker of the House of Representatives. Will Rogers. America's favorite humorist. Out west, a few hardy souls visit Glacier National Park. They go for a climb. A little short on equipment, but strong in spirit. worth the effort, so they say. Uh-oh, there goes Dad. It's not all play. There's still work to be done, and no limit, it seems, to our natural resources. cameraman can't resist his little joke. You see a lot of women in the factories now. These girls are making footballs. And these are making hats. There is a difference. Down at the post office, they're teaching the girls to sort the mail. One thing they learn in a hurry, don't pick up too many at once. Too bad. Here's a clean place for women to work, and steady, too. Some men change their collars twice a week. Machines do more and more of the hard work these days. For instance, here's the way they assemble the spokes and make the wheels for the Model T Ford in Highland Park, Michigan.
the eight-hour workday ends and the men go home, mostly by trolley. Not many can afford to buy a car of their own yet. These men went home long ago, when the war between the states ended. But the hardy survivors, both blue and gray, still meet together once a year to renew old acquaintance. It's 1917, and they're camped at Vicksburg, Mississippi. What memories they must have. They have fought their war. While these raw recruits at Camp Custer in Michigan are being trained to fight another war. The call goes out and youth responds enthusiastically. Just a year ago, we re-elected Woodrow Wilson as president. Now we're in a war we hope to avoid, but we're confident he'll lead us to victory. The mood of the nation changes. We talk about liberty loans and liberty cabbage. Food will win the war, and Uncle Sam needs you. Old heroes are popular again. Here's Theodore Roosevelt, surrounded by crowds wherever he goes. Everything's just bully. And there's a parade in every city and town. Training is deadly serious now. And we're learning to pronounce names of places we've never heard of before. The Argonne, Bello Woods, and Chateau Thierry. Our factories convert to the production of engines and arms. These are the famous Liberty engines. She's doing her bit. Here's a certificate for buying $500 worth of Liberty bonds. Henry Ford receives a Navy contract to build Eagle boats. Here he is in Washington with Josephus Daniels, Secretary of the Navy. Using the technique of the automobile assembly line, the hulls of Eagle boats are riveted together at Ford's new River Rouge plant. Launching of an eagle boat. Sleek and fast, built for anti submarine warfare. At Highland Park, Ford experiments with a small tank powered by two Model T engines. And it crossed the trenches. Not every time. Well, back to the drawing board. The city of Detroit turns out to say goodbye and good luck to those who go to fight in foreign fields. Give up on the small thing. Maybe those skids in back will help. 
going great. Too bad. Big Brother shows how it should be done. Park, the men turn out for a patriotic parade and rally. Another new weapon in this war. Not very effective as yet, but there's glory for the men who fly them. This is the first model of the Martin bomber. Eddie Rickenbacker, America's flying ace, comes home to encourage more plane production. Here's how they manufacture Curtis H-type flying boats. a Liberty engine. The faces of America at war. These are men working in the shipyard at Hog Island. The Red Cross girls, a familiar and friendly sight. Captain Kittle. He's worked at the Bureau of Engraving in Washington since 1864 barracks life in an army camp. More and more troop trains head for points of embarkation. The last cup of coffee before we shove off. A sobering moment. But we won't come back till it's over, over there. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the tank test, there goes another one. But soon the bugs are all ironed out and the government places an order for 15,000 tanks. Lord Northcliffe in Detroit, sent by King George to arrange for the shipment of forts and tractors to Great Britain to speed up the production of food. He tries a new fort soon, followed by Henry Ford. Parades and more parades to keep the home fires burning. Now's the time to buy Liberty Bonds so we can finish the job we've started. Keep buying them, mister. And then it's over. All over. And the world is safe for democracy. One more parade in Washington. There's President Harding and General Black Jack Pershing. They're marching to Arlington Cemetery to bury the unknown soldier. Lots of changes around the country now. Seems like everyone's on the move. But we've got to do something about those roads.
It takes forever to cross a river this way. We begin to build new roads as fast as we can. Mighty smooth riding now. There's one car that takes you anywhere you want to go. The Model T. Strong, sturdy, with a will of its own. Here's how they put them together at the Highland Park plant. A car comes off the end of the line every 10 seconds. Dealers sell them in just about every town in the land. There's no end to what you can do when you own a car. No longer locked on the land, the farmer's wife can get away from the farm for a while and take the baby down the road for a visit. Trucks take over the job of moving produce to market. The Sunday afternoon drive becomes a national habit. This is the Columbia River Highway out in Oregon, built in 1917. Magnificent sights to see in America, and a car is the way to get there. Watch, that bear is hungry. For a real vacation, nothing beats a camping trip. Picnics in the park. Or alongside the lake. You can even sleep in a car if you want. Henry Ford and his friends go camping in style. President Harding arrives to pay a Sunday visit while they're in the Great Smoky Mountains. Here he is with Harvey Firestone. Ford chops wood for exercise.
while Thomas Edison takes a snooze. Firestone offers some friendly advice. The president takes a turn with the act. Ford, Edison, and the president read the papers. One way to keep them down on the farm, buy a tractor. They're selling more every year. Modern equipment speeds up the work, makes it easier and more efficient, too. Now electricity does the chores for the farmer's wife. And running water wherever you want it. No more trips to the pump. And no more churning for grandmother. There's a growing problem in the cities. What to do about all the traffic? Sometimes it seems to go like this. There's a parking problem, even in small towns. The policeman has a new responsibility, directing traffic. Steps are taken to dramatize the need for safer driving. Special motion pictures show what can happen when we're not alert. The age of the automobile changes nearly every aspect of American life. The tempo quickens in city and country. No longer a luxury, almost everyone can afford to own a car. And sometimes it seems that we're all on the road at the same time. We're a nation on the wheel, and soon to take to the air as a slim young man in a silver plane opens up a new horizon. Here he is, Charles A. Lindbergh landing at the Ford Airport. Another pioneer gives us the courage to try something new. In 